when I say prison officer, what's the first thing you think of? What do you associate with it? Hi everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome to By Rachella. So over summer I was given some funding to do some research and this is the result of it. So researching the relationship between black women and British law enforcement. In this video, I'll be talking about prison officers, in particular reference to Natasha Chin and Sarah Reed. I will say prison officer who look after people, they don't follow the law, but they are there to look after those people. Only if you don't follow the rules, you get yourself into trouble. If you follow the rules, you'll be fine. I associate them being strict, like very harsh, because they're in a prison. I think the very nature of prisons and prison officers means that they're not really on the radar for a lot of black women. Mm. Again, it's not really something that comes up in like conversation often. Since they don't see them regularly, um, and since they're not like constantly reminded by their presence, like black women are the police, for example. The nature of prisons being visible, like you can see the buildings, but invisible in the sense that you don't really know what's going on inside. And I guess that's the whole point of them to be like visible yet invisible. There's a reluctance and a very lax approach to ensuring that black life is preserved and that black life is cared for. And we see what happens when that isn't the case, with the case of Sarah Reed, for example. Sarah Lynn Reed was a mixed race black woman who was born on the 22nd of June 1984 in the UK. And her mother, Marilyn Reed, describes her as bright, warm, honest and confident. She grew up with her two siblings and in 2000 gave birth to a daughter and just lived a pretty normal life. That was until Sarah's late teens, when she got into a relationship, and together they had a daughter, Tiana. Sarah went to the hospital a number of times after noticing that something was wrong with Tiana, though the hospital dismissed it as a cold. Tiana was eventually diagnosed with muscular atrophy and died in 2003, at nine months old. And Sarah and her partner were given Tiana's body wrapped in a quilt to take to the funeral director in a taxi. So she witnessed the initial decomposition of her daughter right in front of her. And after this, according to her mum, she was haunted by a vision of the bodily fluid and her mental health worsened. In 2012, Metropolitan Police Constable James Kiddy was caught on CCTV beating Sarah up after she had been arrested for shoplifting. And after several periods in psychiatric hospitals, her life was beginning to have some sort of normal. She had a studio flat, a good partner, and was receiving support from a community psychiatric team. In 2014, she was put in Maudsley Psychiatric Hospital, though was charged with grievous bodily harm with intent in the same year, after fighting off an older male patient who had tried to sexually assault her. From October of 2015, Sarah had been remanded to HMP Holloway for psychiatric reports to establish whether or not she was fit to plead. Though by January of 2016, a report had not been written and she was still in Holloway prison. Sarah struggled in prison and though she allegedly tried to cut her throat two months before arriving, she was judged as low risk and was observed only once an hour. In November of 2015, Sarah's antipsychotic medicine had been reduced and all her medication, including her sleeping tablets, were completely halted in December. And around the beginning of January of 2016, she had been forbidden showers. Sarah had written to her mum, stating that her medication was being withheld, writing, please help me to get out of here. I shouldn't be in here. I'm not being treated. As a result of this, Sarah began hallucinating, chanting, and since she couldn't access the sleeping tablets she had been using and relied on for years, she was sleepless. She complained that a demon punched her awake at night and was on punishment for what the prison officers regarded as bad behaviour. She was isolated with the cell hatch closed, without hot water, heating or a properly clean cell. On the 11th of January 2016, aged 32, 
Sarah Reed was found dead in her cell in Holloway Prison. The jury was told that Sarah had died by self-strangulation, though her family and campaigners debate the likelihood of that, since Sarah had previously complained of bullying. They don't believe that Sarah was physically able to tear up thick prison sheets, tie knots and take her own life in a 10 minute window. The verdict was particularly questionable because her family weren't allowed to see her body during a visit to the hospital and because at first the prison said she was found hanging in her cell then said that she had strangled herself while lying on her bed. Her family and campaigners continued to fight for justice to ensure that vulnerable women are put in hospitals as opposed to prisons. When considering her trauma, Sarah Reed's imprisonment as opposed to her admission into hospital just indicates how the state and within that British law enforcement criminalises mental health and how prison officers facilitate that criminalisation. Essentially, Sarah Reed's criminalisation strips her of her humanity and that stripping of her humanity meant that the stripping of healthcare and consequently her health was made inevitable and was made very easy and it was that stripping of her health um, in terms of medication that led to her death and we obviously can't ignore that Sarah Reed was a victim of police brutality a few years prior to her being imprisoned and oftentimes that is the case like police officers and prison officers are closely linked like people's and black women's first experiences with law enforcement in terms of like the criminal process usually begins with police officers and then escalates and then moves on to prison officers when they are convicted and like tried and sentenced and honestly like I can rant and rave about prisons till the cows come home like I have a lot to say but I think my biggest qualm and a lot of people's biggest qualms with the prison system and with prison officers is that they don't deal with the root issue whereby a lot of people who are in prison should really be in hospitals or in therapy. Maybe she needs some help. Like she just should be there before. Because I feel like that's, that's another that. problem. I feel like there are a lot of people who are going through traumatising situations, different type of mental illness and stuff, and they are thrown into prison and that's if they need different help. Yeah. I think that some people they do need taken care of, regardless of whether they're rude, crazy, psychotic, dirty, like they generally need that tender care and prison's not the place for it. Mm -hmm. It just makes it no, for her. We kept saying you need to take her. And prison officers aren't trained to adequately deal with those people, those specifically those black women in the prison, they're not mental health experts, they're not, like, that's not their job, that's not what they're required to do, and the regulation of prisoners. So when people are in the wrong care facility, so the prison instead of the hospital, they aren't cared for well, or even worse, they aren't cared for, like, at all. And on the prison and probation job government website, it says that prison officers are key workers that are responsible for roughly six inmates, and they're basically there to ensure that those inmates, um, like communicate with their family or that they like they encourage them to participate in like substance recovery um lessons or like sessions and the need for rehabilitation especially of black women in prisons is rife and i'm just putting a trigger warning of sexual assault here and i'll put the timestamp for you to skip to either on the screen or in the description 70 percent of female sentenced prisoners suffer from two or more mental health diagnoses and over half of the women's prison population have suffered domestic violence and a third have been victims of sexual abuse. Black women are largely overrepresented in prisons and though black women make up 3% of the general population in England and Wales, they make up 8.9% of the female prison population and that overrepresentation is a running theme throughout the black population in Britain. So clearly, those issues aren't dealt with adequately in prisons because prison officers are not trained to deal with them like that is not their speciality and these statistics just highlight that these female prisoners specifically black female prisoners are just in need of professional help and healthcare specialists not prison officers and we see this latter point with the case of natasha chin natasha chin was a 39 year old black woman who was taken to prison for failing to keep a probation appointment. She arrived at HMP Bronsfield on the 18th of July 2016 
and was seen by a doctor on admission and was prescribed medication to reduce the effects of alcohol and opiate withdrawal. The prescribed medications were administered that day, so on the 18th, and her next scheduled administration was 8am the next day, so the 19th of July 2016. Methadone at 8am and chlordiapoxide at 8am and 12 noon. Neither medication was administered to Natasha Chin until 6.34pm on the 19th of July. Though she was extremely ill, continuously throwing up for nine hours after she was placed on the gel specialist drug and alcoholic wing, she received no medical aid or retention. The prison officer responsible for the wing that Natasha was on was not aware of what Natasha's medical requirements were, i.e. what she had been prescribed or what medication should have been administered. In the late morning of the 19th of July and again at 4pm, the prison officer raised concerns about Natasha, though nobody tended to her until seven minutes past six in the evening. And the prison officer didn't complain to or notify a more senior prison officer about the delay in Natasha being seen by clinical staff. HMP Bondfield explained this by arguing that they didn't tend to Natasha because her faulty cell bell failed to inform the staff of her cause and because they didn't know why she failed to collect her medication. This failure is amplified when learning that Natasha suffered with depression, drug and alcohol dependency and poor physical health. No clinical observations were made of Natasha Chin's conditions between 14 minutes past 9 in the morning and 6.34pm and no records of her fluid loss or intake on the 19th of July were taken. She was seen on CCTV many times going to and from the water fountain and the observations that were made at 14 minutes past 9 and 6.34 weren't up to par with the National or Sodexo Justice Service, the company that owned the prisons, protocol from those withdrawing from opiates and alcohol. Natasha Chin died on the 19th of July 2016 from metabolic derangement caused by profuse vomiting which was a consequence of underrated withdrawal from opiates and alcohol. She was found unresponsive in her cell at 10.31am on the 19th of July, less than 36 hours after she arrived at the prison. The inquest jury concluded that her death was caused by a systemic failure through poor governance which led to a lack of basic care, and that the death was contributed to by neglect. By the 30th of November 2018, HMP Bronzefield still had no formal process in place to know if critical medicine was being given on time, and there's no evidence to suggest that any formal auditing of clinical records in the prison has been taken since 2015. Thinking Natasha's life could have been saved? There were many opportunities that the prison had to, 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 to recognise that Tasha needed help. Uh, if they had monitored her correctly and communicated with each other, um, simple things really, um, those simple things could have saved Natasha's life. Uh, it, it, to be honest, uh, as a family, we're very angry about that. And this neglect isn't a one-off or a two-off thing with Lucera Reed and Natasha Chin. Like, this is a big thing. Black women are victims of prison officer incompetency and laxness and neglect. Annabella Landsberg had moved from Zimbabwe to the UK in 2002, to Worthing specifically in West Sussex. She became a senior care worker and lived a pretty normal life with diabetes up until she was diagnosed HIV positive. Her sister, Sandra Landsberg, said it was then, in 2007, when Annabella's personality and behaviour changed, when she started acting childishly, drinking, and in 2016, Annabella Landsberg was sentenced to four and a half years in prison for robbery and assault. In September of 2017, Annabella was restrained in her cell by four prison officers after she refused to take her medication. And after this restraint, Annabella lay on the floor of her cell in the segregation unit at HMP Peterborough and didn't get up. The prison officers that checked on her cell recorded that she remained on the floor, yet none of them entered her cell to check she was okay. The nurse, prison officers and duty manager made the checks the following day when they found Annabella in the same position, but they didn't raise concerns. 
and the prison records show that a nurse had actually thrown a cup of cold water over her, anticipating that she would respond. And even when she didn't respond, the nurse recorded that Annabella was seeking attention and faking medical issues. It was only at 2.45pm, the afternoon after the initial restraint, when the prison staff became concerned and proceeded to check her blood, oxygen and sugar levels, and they realised at this point that she was seriously ill, which was particularly worrying because she was diabetic. Annabella Landsberg was consequently taken to hospital, where she remained in intensive care up until her death three days later. She died from multi-organ failure, and her death was recorded as a death from natural causes. And I don't think I need to say this, but I will. Committing a crime isn't a death penalty, like it's not a death sentence. Like they were sentenced for however long, but that doesn't mean that it's a death sentence. So if they do die in custody, it should be taken seriously. Like a death sentence would be the death sentence, but the death sentence was abolished in 1969 in England. So like there's no need, there's, there, there should be no reason why somebody should die in prison, especially when it could be avoided. Kind of like the same way I see a prison, an immigration officer, kind of like a warden figure, um, quite hostile, um, trying to like inflict intimidation and stuff like that. Like, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I will continue saying it like prisons do not exist outside of society and prison officers do not exist outside of society so those same systems of oppression that exist in wider society are replicated and are maintained within the prison so let's say for example there's a racist prison officer that will inevitably affect black prisoners and specifically black female prisoners um, because of how misogynoir works um, and I guess this isn't only restricted to prisoners like it includes black members of staff within the prison institution so be it prison officers themselves so black female prison officers themselves all the prisoners all catering stuff just anybody like within the prison institution because prisons don't exist outside of society even though they are somewhat invisible so yeah honestly i did find it quite difficult to research um black women's relationship with prisons and with prison officers as in, I feel like there is kind of like a discretion or there is a silence that goes around prison officers. Um, and like the black women who could tell me about their relationship with prison officers are either in prison or it's quite difficult to know if someone has a prison or like a criminal background who, who has spent time in prison, basically. Um, so, yeah, I did find it quite difficult. So if anyone has access to information or just like resources that you think could be useful to me, please let me know. So yeah, that would really be helpful and that would really be nice. So yeah. So that's the end of this video um, on the relationship between black women and prison officers. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.